so try to uh, respect others listen to understand which is in contrast to listening only to find out when they're going to stop so that you can start talking right <laughs> um, yeah. embrace ambiguity and preserve the integrity of stories what that means is that um, you can share with others outside of the class things that you're learning about the scriptures, but don't tell anybody else's story without their permission. And ambiguity in relation to scriptural interpretation is an important principle because as we'll review in a minute, sometimes there are discrepancies in the Bible and sometimes there are just things that plain don't make any sense. Like in the book of Exodus, even though Moses has been called by God for a very important mission, there's a, a passage much later in the book that said God sought to kill Moses. It's like, what? We're not going to study that verse, by the way. Um, use I messages, which means claim responsibility for your own thoughts. Uh, don't reference other people or put blame on anyone else. Let's focus on our ideas and trust that everybody is bringing their best self and learn by just listening to a variety of perspectives. Mine might differ from your own, and that's fine, but we don't wanna um, interrupt or, I, I know because I like to be very engaged in conversation, sometimes I need to ask myself, W-A-I-T, why am I talking? So if you find yourself talking a little bit more than maybe some other people or you notice some people haven't said anything, you might restrain yourself and I'll try to help draw out people whose voices we haven't heard as much. I appreciate that you turn off your, the sound on your cell phone at least and we'll, we like to start on time and end on time. So if we go over, um, just start leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way. I'll try to close on time, but if any of you want to, <laughs> I'm not leading worship after this, so if any of you want to continue the conversation, we can certainly do that. And then let's flip that over, and this is over the years, the Presbyterian Church has developed certain principles for how we interpret and read scripture, and this is because we need something positive to say other than just, well, we don't take it literally. Well, how do we take it, all right? So we read scripture through the lens of the centrality of Jesus Christ as the manifestation of God, the word made flesh. So that looking back in history and looking forward in history, but also uh, through the lens of the people of faith and their relationship to God, Jesus is central. We really look at the plain text. What, what does it say? And what, and not read into it what it doesn't say. We depend on the guidance of the Holy Spirit, just as I prayed and as we do in worship, we always pray for the Spirit to help us interpret it. And in the Presbyterian Church, as well as some other Reformed churches, one of the best ways we know of how the Spirit is guiding us to the meaning of the Scripture is by doing it together in community, um, the Spirit guiding the community. Be guided by the rule of faith. That means what have Christians before us interpreted the passage to mean? So a larger body. Be guided by the rule of love, which is why I lifted up that one verse, God sought to kill Moses. You know, it just doesn't really fit with the image of God that we see in the whole of scripture. Um, but perhaps it's in there to help us remember that God is a, a wild and mysterious force. But the rule of love should always be one of the plumb lines that we use as we interpret the scripture. We need to study. So the reason we're doing this year long uh, class is because there's a lot in terms of the social context, the historical context, the theological thinking at the time that the uh, book was written, how the books relate to one another. There's a lot that goes into this. 
we're not going to be um, delving into the meaning of Hebrew and Greek today because there's so much else to talk about, but that sometimes is helpful as well. And we try to interpret passages uh, in light of the whole of the Bible. So, having said all of that, let's turn to Exodus 3, which is the second book of Anybody know how many books there are in the Bible? 66. 66. Does everyone have a Bible? If not, you need to, what you need right now is both a Bible and a handout that's over on the table that says Bible study on Exodus. So we want to have several voices in the room. This is a long, chapter if we are, i think we're all using the new revised standard version which was uh, published in 1989 there have been many different versions of the bible published um, and it has two headings moses at the burning bush and the divine name revealed so it's basically got two major portions here and I, this particular chapter we're not going to be uh, learning about the whole, much about the whole book, but this particular section and the story that begins with it is part of what's called the narrative of deliverance or the narrative of liberation. So let's, uh, we'll go, we're going to go big and then focus more specifically until toward the end of the class we'll, we'll get personal. All right, so let's start in the back rows and each of you just read um, a few sentences. Can we start with you, Ira? And we're starting Exodus 3, chapter 3, and we're only reading the chapter 3. So in my book, it's page 50 in the Old Testament. Yes. Not everybody has necessarily. Moses at the burning bush. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked at, he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals <coughs> from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Okay. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out, up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> the cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to, the Pharaoh, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Okay. Larry? But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is this is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I have sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. Okay, Lynn. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. I declare that I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us now go a three days journey into the wilderness, so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I know, however, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. After that, he will let you go. I will bring this people into such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. Each woman shall ask her neighbor and any woman living in the neighbor's house for jewelry of silver and of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and so you shall find with the Egyptians. So we could take two hours just studying this one chapter um, there, is so, there are so many interesting dimensions to it. So I know it's going to be frustrating that we're not going to be going as in-depth with every, every single part of it because I think it's also important to understand the context in which this was written and, and was told and retold. So when either of my predecessors taught, did they talk to you about the four s sources of material for the first five books of the Bible? Does last week, early dawn, day. Okay, so that's on your handout. And for those of you who may not have been here, I'll just quickly review that. The first five books of the Bible, Exodus being the second one, are what in the Hebrew tradition is considered the Torah, or it's also called the Pentateuch. And there was a time in which that it was also called the five books of Moses. I didn't talk to a rabbi to find out if they still talked it, about it that way or not, but ancient Jewish tradition put the authorship of these first five books as Moses, but recent scholarship, well, actually it's been scholarship that's been around since the 19th century, believes that there are four different streams, four different documents that were edited and used sometimes together, sometimes for particular books um, for the source material. And Moses was not the author of all five books, which of course he couldn't be because of them. some of them talk about him after he's died. So we have J, which uses Yahweh, uh, the name for God, which is in Genesis. E, which uses the name Elohim for God. J and E both were part of forming Genesis. I think probably Matt talked to you or Jeff about two different creation stories. That comes from these two different source materials. Uh, D, which is basically the book of Deuteronomy, likely the book that was found in the temple when Josiah was king. And P, which is of the priestly tradition, which is more concerned about Holy, holiness and orderliness, and also is the most recent source. And the book of Exodus, there are different perspectives. Some think it's a combination of J and E, but its final form was not finished probably until the priestly period, which is post-exilic. And the exile period was 587 to 538 BC. And it's important to realize that this book in its final form was probably either toward the end of the 
exile or after the exile because um, that would have been the 6th century BCE, reflecting on events that were believed to have happened 700 years prior to that. So we have strong oral tradition that became written form that then was collected and combined that eventually was chosen to be part of the canon, okay? Um, but realize that when this written form was finalized, the Hebrew people themselves were living under foreign powers. Anybody remember who that was? The Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. So for them, Pharaoh would have stood in for their, their oppressive ruler, which would have been Nebuchadnezzar, okay? So what we're gonna find is that the book of Exodus um, is paradigmatic history. And the, the, what we mean by that is that the themes, the major themes of the narrative of deliverance are a paradigm for other times in history with the people of faith or even beyond the people of faith for them to also recognize Oh, so when there is tyranny and oppression, this is how God acts. And there are two paradigms that we're going to explore. One is this, the paradigm of the deliverance narrative, and the other is a paradigm for vocational call, and that's the specific calling to Moses. So um, it's hard to make a direct historical connection between the people in Exodus and the people of Genesis, but we do see even in this own chapter that God is making the connection. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob when God is introducing who this voice is coming from to Moses, all right? Why is it hard? Pardon me? Why is it hard? Because even if it's the same God. We don't have a direct, sometimes you'll find gene genealogies, for example, that kind of direct, line sometimes you'll you in other types of books you'll have a more historical here's where we are and here's when we are we don't have that necessarily with connecting the book of uh, exodus with the book of genesis however um, the themes there are definitely connecting themes the god who cr made creation and made promises of land to ancestors is this same God, all right? So there are three <clears throat> uh, major theological motifs in the book of Exodus, and this is on your handout as well. The deliverance and liberation of people who've been oppressed under Pharaoh, um, and that God not only liberated them, but sustains them after they've they fled from under his oppression. Covenant, which you began to learn about, I think last week, the covenant-making God, and we hear this verse in scripture often, I shall be your God and you shall be my people. So if you think of covenant similar to the kind of promises made in a wedding um, where we're, we're committed to each other once and for all throughout your lifetime, which demands faith and loyalty by the people of Israel to God. And we know <clears throat> from the stories in the Bible, the people were not always faithful, but God, though God sometimes became angry at their infidelity, was always faithful. And the third theme, which is kind of interesting, but we're not gonna spend any time of it at all on it, is God's presence. How can we now that we are a traveling people, people wandering in the wilderness, going to have some way of experiencing that God is present with us wherever we go. And so it's all about creating an institutional structure of the tabernacle. So if we think about those themes through the eyes of a post-exilic people, liberation, as I already mentioned, would see the um, Egyptian pharaoh as their Babylonian 
Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, who conquered and assaulted J Jerusalem. Covenant to people that are living in exile would be a strong claim to who they are as a people, to their identity, and it's a membership of a people that's the alternative to accommodating to the empire. So instead of accommodating themselves uh, to the occupying force, they're retaining their identity as a covenant people. And presence would be a sense of God's energy and courage and divine accompaniment to them, even in an empire that wants to block out and empty them of any sense of any power in their lives other than the empire, all right? So, as I said, chapters 1 through 15 is called the narrative of the exodus or liberation or deliverance. And um, it's this, the narrative becomes a paradigm because it helps the people. And whenever I use the word Israel, I'm not talking about what, who we know to be a geographic country, but the people, the Hebrew people of Israel. And the book of Exodus is redefining, reiterating, reinforcing that um, God has chosen them as a beloved community and intervenes historically on their behalf. And that becomes the repeated narrative of who our God is. Um, and we see in the book of Exodus that God is, mounts a very vigorous assault on every oppressive establishment of abusive power. So while we can't either affirm or deny what's true or not true historically, uh, it's, it's better to think about this instead of a reportage of history, to think about it as paradigmatic history. And if you look on your handout, what that means is that this particular narrative, the power of its truth, is told and retold. So you have three other examples in the scriptures in the Old Testament where this same paradigm of how God works with God's people shows up. So in Joshua 4, it's the story itself is, is repeated, and you're going to be looking at Joshua in a week or two. And then in Samuel, it's referenced not by the Hebrew people, but by the Philistines who knew the story. And uh, after the God triumphed through the ark against them, they also were reminded, oh my goodness, this is the same God who struck down the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. So they reference this, oh, we recognize what's going on here. And then in Isaiah, in the context of Jews returning home <coughs> from Babylon, this is after the exile, they also remember the journey of liberation with, with great joy. And we're not going to look at these specific verses, but there are other, the retelling of the deliverance story itself happens in Deuteronomy in a couple places in Joshua. It's also in one of the Psalms. So there, there are more places than just that. So that, that's just to help you understand that though we're going to be looking at one chapter, it, the power of this particular narrative um, is much bigger. So there, there was a whole book. My husband couldn't find it at our house, but um, we probably gave it away. But let's take a moment ourselves to think about when in our own history in the United States or maybe in other countries of our world in our lifetimes, do you remember the, the story of deliverance or the story of Moses or the story of a promised land? Where else has that shown up? <laughs> Century, you know, the Germany, uh, in, in Japan, in Italy, I 
So what was the first sentence? Who uh, was in, it? In 20th century history. In 20th century? Yeah, Hitler, Mussolini, Tojo, you know, they became uh, so like, you know, dictatorial force to take over the world, and they succeeded. It looked like they succeeded, but eventually the United States came in as a deliverer. Okay, so you're, you're connecting our involvement in World War, the Allies in World War I or II as having that break of the oppression. All right, what else do you think of? Yes? I think of the language of Martin Luther King in some of his speeches. I've been to the mountaintop and so on. Very much so. So Martin Luther King made several references. So close to his death, actually, he said, I've been to the mountaintop. I may not get there with you, which mm -hmm. is exactly what Moses said. Moses did not he died before he was able to get into the promised land with his people, but he did see the promised land when he went up to a mountaintop, and that's in the Bible. So he's making direct reference. But what else about Martin Luther King? Yes. Well, I was going to say something. I was going to say modern day Israel is a, is a <coughs> pro promised land again. Okay, so they claim that whole identity and the promise of land, right? You think of anything else um, connected to Martin Luther King? Yes, Claudia? Well, I, I think all of American history resonates with the notion of a promised land, with the idea of people in covenant. The first document that English settlers in the New World created was called a covenant, the Mayflower Covenant. Mm -hmm. And looking westward throughout the first two centuries of American history, it was always depicted in terms of the promised land and a place where you could escape your past, find a new prosperity and new freedom. So mm -hmm. it, I think it resonates throughout our history. So we have claimed that myth, the pilgrims and their feeling oppressed and, or being oppressed and coming to the new land, so that's part of it as well. Um, now it's... Vicky? Yes. One thing about Martin Luther King, I'll keep this short. I think today he's really considered a prophet. He's considered a prophet because um, he was considered a prophet, because he knew and understood the times in which we were living. They were not right. There was not, um, people were not equal because of the color of their skin, but this was a dream. This was something that he was predicting, hopefully, our Lord God would bring to pass. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be... Thank you so much for letting me... Sure. We need to be yeah. okay. very careful and critical when we apply the par this paradigm of deliverance because it's definitely in its origins about a people who were oppressed. All right? So you can see how pilgrims could make the case. You could see how African Americans... Yeah could make that case, yeah. but Manifest Destiny, we actually ended up oppressing Native Americans when we were exploring and taking more land. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we're, we're not applying the paradigm in a wrong context, yeah. okay? So let's, let's bring this a little more uh, focused. The, um, when we talk about Moses and, and the Exodus, as I've said, this becomes a, a central theme of scripture and of the Hebrew people who tell the story, sing the story. We, there is African-American spiritual, you, you've all heard of, I'm sure. Go down Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. All right, yes? Now, just getting back to the uh, parallels in history, I mean, the experience of slavery, obviously, being connected to King, but I guess my, what I'm perplexed about is that, my understanding is that um, slave, the slave people were taught Christianity and encouraged to study the Bible or at least hear stories and stuff, but 
wasn't, didn't that work at cross purposes of keeping people oppressed by basically giving them an instruction manual of how to be so it's a The reason that slaves were not encouraged to learn how to read was because they could read things like the Bible. And there were sometimes slaves who were not permitted to go to their own churches, but only were at, in congregations where the preacher was white and the white preacher would only preach from the letters of Paul, which Paul just says, whether you are slave or free, you're in Christ. He doesn't challenge that there are slaves. He welcomes slaves, but uh, parts of the revolutionary story were not allowed to be heard or read in some, some instances. And you're right, liberation theology, which is a stream of theology that was, I think, started in maybe the 70s in Central and South America, very much um, identifies with this revolutionary story. In fact, when my husband and I were trying to learn Spanish, we moved to Tucson, Arizona. I worked in the sanctuary movement for a while with Central American refugees. and we immersed ourselves in a little village in Mexico and we lived with a family who were part of the base, what was called the base Christian community movement. The liberation theology was being taught through small gatherings of Christians looking at the Bible and I didn't know my Spanish well, very well at the time but when I went down for breakfast one morning, the father in this little house and it was a very poor family, but he was reading Exodus and he said, God loves the poor. So it is a very much uh, does feed into oppressed people understanding themselves in a new way. And controversial too, ironically. I mean, liberation theology is not welcomed by many, or not, maybe not many, but certain strains of Christianity. Liberation theology is considered radical and that's true. Yeah. Why is that? The scriptures are very challenging if you are a people that are in power. Challenges having wealth, it challenges how you use your political might, it challenges using weapons instead of other means when you have <coughs> difficulties. It's, it's the whole Bible is pretty much a challenge to the status quo. So when we hear the term liberation theology, it can be equated with things like um, leveling the playing field or, you know. Yes. Just and politicizing, maybe maybe it's a politicization of the, the Bible? That well, if you're against liberation theology, you would say it politicizes it. But if you hear it as the uh, framework for how God works with God's people, um, liberating a the oppressed and anyone whose rights are being abused, then you don't hear it as a, it, it's just what the gospel says, right? That's, that's the word. I think it's really interesting. I mean, if you want to kind of wrestle with the dynamic is Bonhoeffer. If you've ever read Bonhoeffer's thing, he ended up obviously on the side of giving his life. But at the same time, if you read his work, he wrestled with that from a theological perspective because of the dynamic of what was happening to the people and the horrifying aspect of that, but on the dynamic of respecting authority, right? And so, you know, either obviously he landed on the side of protecting the Jews, but you know, for those who want to kind of understand maybe the dynamic of the struggle, is he's got some very interesting writing. And liberation theology um, does include a phrase preferential option for the poor that if God were to take sides, the side that God would take would be the side of the poor. So if you're not one of the poor, you might feel a little resistant to that kind of theology, right? All right, well, let's, let's help ourselves, <coughs> again, locate this particular scripture. How did the Hebrews get to Egypt in the first place? Yes? Uh, through Joseph. Through so Joseph, right? And and yes, so um, actually Abraham and Sarah were a nomadic people. 
and there was even a famine in their time that says they went to Egypt, but we do know that there was a famine that drove Joseph to Egypt, and eventually, what do you remember? Did you study this last, did you study Joseph last week? About how he, okay, so he, um, okay, so Joseph was a descendant, obviously, and he uh, became, was in the, became quite honored in the king's court because he could interpret dreams. And so his, his people were highly respected and they became quite numerous and so numerous <coughs> that when a new king came into power who didn't know anything about Joseph or Joseph's ancestry or, or <coughs> descendants, just felt threatened. Kind of like, oh, you know, all those Mex Mexicans, they're rapists and murderers. We shouldn't <laughs> let them in here. And, but these people are already here, so it's more like, well, okay, well, let's deport all the people that are already here. Um, there's a, some kind of a threat. And so um, that the new king is wanting to get rid of all, all these descendants. So we know that what was one of the ways that, um, what was one, one of the first ways that the king tried to get rid of them? He wanted to kill all the baby boys. Okay, so remember the, the story about Moses in the basket as a baby in the bulrushes? That's because his mother, rather than drown him in the river, put him in a basket in the river. And this is a wonderful story of, of women. We're not gonna have time to go into it, but I love it because she placed him in this little basket floating down the river, but she followed it, as did Moses' sister. And the basket floated close enough to wherever Pharaoh's family lived that it was discovered by none other than Pharaoh's daughter who took pity on the baby and wanted to rescue it. And then Moses' sister comes out of the bushes and says to her, don't you need a nursemaid? Well, yes, I do. And that's Moses' mother. So she presents herself as his nursemaid. So Moses then was raised in Pharaoh's house. Did you say Moses, mother? Moses' mother was his nursemaid. Moses' sister was the one who presented her as the option. Okay, so let's think a little bit about this. Um, if you were God and you needed someone to liberate the Hebrew people, who would you look around and choose? All right, so I'm just gonna t talk about who Moses was as, as a person um, and why you think he was the one. So imagine um, being a gifted, we have every reason to think, although he stuttered, that Moses was pretty intelligent. So you have this gifted Levite who grew up in Pharaoh's household a foster child of wealth, educated with Pharaoh's children. He acquired a trained and disciplined intellect and living with Pharaoh, an insider's understandings, not only of Pharaoh's personality, but also the workings of power. John Gunneman says it's no accident that the leaders of a revolution are almost always renegades from the ruling class. It is they who understand power and are best equipped, having, having rejected an old paradigm to engage in innovative reconstruction. Revolutionaries typically identify with lower classes. When struggling for equality of the oppressed, they are really fighting for their own equality. And another person, Wilfred Dane, wonders what was it like for an intruder from below to grow up under Pharaoh's nose? How would a student more intelligent than Pharaoh's own sons be treated? The teacher was bound to falsify by lowering his pupil's gra graces, thus preserving the belief that 
Intelligence was a hereditary endowment in the royal blood. Now we know that Moses was lacking in self-confidence not only because we meet him as a very angry young man, but he stuttered as an adult, both signs of distress. And then later, when he, when after he's talking to God, well, he comes up with five different reasons why he's not the guy, right? We also know about Moses that when he left the palace grounds one day as a young man, he saw an Egyptian strike a Hebrew slave. And he was so angry that he what? He killed the Egyptian. And therefore, he had to flee for his life. He became a political refugee. So while he was in the desert as a refugee, he spent many years as a shepherd. And we also experienced his character in that early on, when there were other women tending their sheep at the well, some others came along and drove them away. And he came into the context and protected them, shoot away the others so that they could allow their own sheep to drink. And the, uh, in fact, one of those women ended up becoming his wife. But there again, you see that in his personhood, he's <coughs> someone that responds with compassion and with anger around injustice. So the other part about this paradigm of vocation, looking at who he was and why God chose him, may also have to do with the fact that um, he would have had a lot to wrestle through in himself in the quiet of the desert, right? Here he was in exile himself. He had to deal with his own anger. He, uh, we don't become co-creators with God just because we've suffered. We also have to work on the dark forces that churn inside of ourselves. So he had a lot of time to brood on his own history and to be in touch with his own despair and asking himself on behalf of the Hebrew people what must be done and what can I do? So that silent meditation time probably really gave him an opportunity to be reshaped because vision never comes without contemplation. We know that um, later in, in chapter three, Moses says to God, who am I to go to Pharaoh and God responds, I shall be with you. So God doesn't go through all the things I just did with you. Look, you're, you, you're a smart guy. You're, you care about justice. You know how Pharaoh operates. You're a Hebrew person. He doesn't do that whole, this is why you. He just says, I am will, with you, or I will be with you. So when one of the ways that we know that we're hearing a call from God is when we have a feeling of awe-filled dread combined with knowing that we're accompanied by God. And in another class when I taught about how do you discern call, one of the marks is it seems impossible and it's risky. And so those are actually marks of call. So we're going to take a few moments. Let me we're um, running out of time here, but I want to pass out a handout for you to do your own little bit of reflection on when have you, in your life, had a, an experience <coughs> of God's presence or perhaps a sense of call? And then when have you found yourself making excuses? So. Um, we'll probably have to send some papers up. Do we have to do this now? Can we get it back to you next week? No, you need to do it now and take it home. <laughs>
We don't have enough time to do it thoroughly, but let me just, so um, this goes beyond the chapter that we just read into some more of the excuses are also in chapter four, but um, I've already mentioned after God makes clear what he wants Moses to do, which is a pretty risky, dangerous thing to do, and he responds, who am I? And God says, I will be with you. And then his second thing he says is he doesn't know God's name. And we'll come back to that at the very end. God saying, I am who I am, as well as God identifying uh, the God of his fathers. The third excuse, well, I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected. What if they don't believe me? All right, and then God provides a staff with miraculous powers. And the fourth excuse, which is in chapter uh, four, I can't speak, and he's referring to the fact that he stuttered. So, um, yeah, or no, be before that even, first let's see. I've never been eloquent, nor even now that you've spoken to your servant, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. That, well, that, that is partly the stuttering thing. And then in verse 13, um, well, to that, God says, I'm going to give you the words that you need. But Moses still isn't, he's, he's still not ready. He says, Lord, please send someone else. And then God gets a little more uh, pissed off and says, <laughs> all right, but that's it for your excuses. I'm going to give you Aaron, your brother, and he can your spokesperson okay so let's take a few moments for a, a little current application um, and I encourage you to do this at home yes does pray for your enemies come anywhere in this talk that we've talked this morning um, Jesus certainly taught that it's part of the um, Sermon on the Mount and there are some parallels which we didn't have time to go into with uh, Jesus also going to the mountain and spending 40 days in the desert. You know, there are parallels with his life as well. Um, all right, so I want you to think about in your own life, if you've ever had a, a penetrating insight or a luminous moment where you sensed the life force just beyond just you or a sense of presence of God or some a concern that just keeps haunting you all the time that won't let you go. I'm, I've been having nightmares about climate change myself recently. Um, or a compelling encounter with human need that might be speaking to you of how God is, God's spirit is churning inside of you. So just think about that for a minute. And again, there may be some common theme to that. This is an exercise you could reflect on over the course of a week. But just, just note something about that. Now, I want you to imagine that God's asking you to do something about whatever that compelling concern, human need, or encounter with God's presence was. And when you imagine doing something about it, what comes up in you in terms of any kind of fear or hesitancy or you've got the wrong person or um, obstacles? Yes, Margaret? Well, I face the need to ask for something, whether it's a new job or some help until I get the new job or something like that. I find myself already saying, well, they'll probably say no, so I shouldn't ask. Okay, so. Or, I should, or I'm deciding already, I shouldn't bother that person, I shouldn't ask. All right, so we have a tendency to go negative. Um, in fact, I just was reading about neuroscience is so interesting. It says that probably for our own survival as a human species, we, our brains go to the negative almost instantaneously. And if we want to live into the positive, we, we have to dwell on something for 20 seconds 
for it to really get into us. So practicing gratitude, practicing looking for what's hopeful, we have to intentionally do that because we're wired to, to be on guard for what might threaten us in some way, right? What were you saying, Claudia? Okay. Now, l let's just use my example. If my nightmares are saying that God is trying to get my attention, that I need to do something about climate change, my first reaction is, it is so huge. <laughs> what can one little person do, right? So that's my, and I'm, I, I lift that up because I'm sure for Moses, freeing Hebrew people under Pharaoh's oppression felt just as huge. I was told that um, if we uh, recycled something every day, if this if we've done just a, a little bit, which is very valuable to help climate change. Every little thing helps, yeah. that's for sure. Anybody else, um, what comes to your mind if you were to think about who am, that question, who am, who am I, God, that I should be the one that you're trying to use? One question. That's what concerns you? And when you think about doing something about homelessness, what does that stir up inside of you? Because I want to be a prevention ministry. Okay. And, and, and I'm going to address some of the MSA bills. Okay, so you've, you've already identified things you can do to take action. So that's great. Good. So that's a positive response. You're taking God seriously. Anybody else have an example? Yes. But I, on the who am I, part of it is like, who am I to say no to God? So you can turn it around the other way. That's true. Right. I'm glad you, there is that piece. <laughs> and I think that may be also why the whole introduction before the um, specific, specifics about <coughs> what God wanted Moses to do was this powerful experience of seeing and hearing God through a bush that didn't burn. And it, talk, it talks about his taking his sandals off so that it, is, it establishes very clearly that, um, whoops, that doesn't look quite the same. So let me say one more word. I want you to keep thinking about how uh, Exodus 3 is both a paradigmatic narrative for deliverance against our, away from tyranny, but also a paradigm for God's call on our lives. And we, when the, um, God says, I am who I am, as well as identifying uh, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Some modern rabbis have interpreted this God as telling Moses, I am the God of your past, of your memories, of your historical roots, of your ancestors, all of which I know are important to you. I was there with you in your suffering and in your joy wherever you were. And on the other hand, because God also tells Moses to tell the children of Israel, uh, I am who I am, which in Hebrew is translated, I will be who I will be. Mm -hmm. The rabbis also interpret this as saying, although I was with you in your past, I am also a God who invites new possibilities for the future. Your past, while essential to your identity, does not exhaust all that you will become either as individuals or as a community. When I tell you that there's a promised land out there, I am telling you that the future can be different from the past, that you and your community be can, can become something new. So when we think about who is it that's saying, I am with you, it's the God of the past and the God of the future. The, banners that I made that are in the sanctuary right now that say I am in the lectionary. Yeah. I originally chose those words because all of the banners reflect the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the good shepherd, I am the gate, I am the vine, 
you know, all those things that God is, Jesus is. But it's also because I am who I am. I wonder, you talked about like the paradigms and stuff, and part of this I think is about a paradigm shift and being open to paradigm shifts. And in Moses' time, it was, the paradigm was the Hebrews were slaves. Right. That's what it all, it was before, it will always be. That's just our reality. And to kind of start thinking about another reality, and I think that happens in our own lives too. Like, you know, I think about like the first time I saw my parents as being vulnerable, for example, that's a paradigm shift. Right. Um, you know, realizing that it's my turn to help take care of them as opposed to them taking care of me, which was the reality my whole life before that. So even, I don't know, maybe even seeing a burning bush, and instead of seeing it as a burning bush, which is the reality up until then, you see it as something different. So right. we can probably extend that to a lot of different examples. Right, thank you. I know I'm gonna go over two minutes now, but I just have to build on what you're saying, that new painting that's hanging in the commons oh, by yes. Gerald Griffin, yes. is Wonderful. he considers that part of his continued series um, called the paradigm shift. And in this case, with the painting of Jesus ascending, the poem that he read to us, which will eventually be hang next to the painting, is this whole paradigm shift. You thought you, ch you thought you killed him, but he rose. You thought you made him suffer, but he was victorious. So this whole paradigm shift of how God works. Go in peace knowing that God goes with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Vicki. You're welcome. <laughs>